happy little games. Growing up in the early 80s was a magical time, especially if you were a fan of video games. Also growing up in a family full of bowlers helped because every Saturday I would hit the lanes to knock down a few pins, but also check out the latest and greatest arcade games. When Pac-Man made the cultural splash that it did, it was not uncommon to see four or five machines lined up and every one of them full. Something else that was great about the golden age of arcades was the multiplayer aspect. If someone was playing a co-op game, all it took was a quick hello while dropping in your quarter to have a little multiplayer madness. Today, we are taking a look at a title that offered not only a two-player option, but three players simultaneously. This game featured a big hulking brute who would go into a rage and decimate anybody who got in his path. No, this is not a Will Smith simulator. This is Rampage, and it was released by Bally Midway in the arcades in 1986. This simultaneous three-player monster mayhem extravaganza was wildly successful upon its arrival, and it would go on to create a franchise that resulted in a big-budget movie starring Dwayne Johnson. Where did the inspiration for these monsters come from? What problems did corporate have with this game? Did this series actually show nudity? So let's destroy some tanks and climb some buildings because this is the history of Rampage. Video games where giant monsters are creating all sorts of mass destruction have been a thing since even before Rampage. One of the first games to tackle this would be 1981's Crush, Crumble and Chomp by Epic Software. The company would also release the movie Monster Game, which was also released in 1986, but I couldn't determine if this was released before or after Rampage. And of course, in later years, we had the stellar King of the Monsters on the Neo Geo. However, when speaking about Rampage, this game did not start out as a giant monster title. Artist Brian Collin was hired by Bally Midway for an animator position in 1982. Although he struggled at first, he kept at it, and soon his distinctive pixel art would soon be seen in games such as Discs of Tron and Spy Hunter, among others. It was around this time that Mr. Collin was getting the itch to allow his art style to evolve. He wanted to use larger characters that would show more emotion, but this would require large multi-sprite characters. In 1985, Mr. Collin attended an industry trade show and was excited about the beautifully animated backgrounds and characters in the competition's arcade games. He had been discussing the limitations of Midway's MCR3 hardware with his contemporaries. The underpowered board did not allow hardware scrolling, scaling, or animated backgrounds. After not taking no for an answer, someone on the team said that he could animate a rectangle and that was about it. He paused for just a moment and thought of a building falling into itself. He figured they could cover up the missing pixels at the bottom with dust clouds. And what could tear down these giant buildings but giant Kong-sized characters? Mr. Collin immediately got to work designing a document and the first character he created was a large ape-like creature. In a line straight from the document, players discover the biggest, meanest, the baddest dudes they've ever seen in an arcade game and they control them. He felt that the punch was the key to the game's success so he spent a lot of time getting it animated properly. Since George turned out great, he presented it to their bosses, and their response was... Denied! Mr. Collin decided to go above his boss's head to the vice president of engineering who loved the idea, but felt that they couldn't show cops being eaten. He also couldn't have the player being the bad guy. Mr. Collin tried to explain that he always felt that the monsters were victims, not unlike Lon Chaney or Boris Karloff in the classic 30s monster movies, but to no avail. Rather than be dissuaded, he started work on it anyway just to prove the concept. It ended up being a good thing he kept working on it because the top three people at Midway were replaced. 
Their replacement was Maury Furchin, who absolutely loved the idea and greenlit the project. Contrary to popular urban legends, the monsters were not based on the Universal Monsters, nor were there ever any licensing agreements in place. According to Mr. Collin, he was always a huge fan of Ray Harryhausen's stop-motion puppetry, so George is based on King Kong. Lizzie is not based on Godzilla, but rather Ymir from 20 million miles to Earth, and Ralph is Ralph because he's just George with his head swapped out using a different color palette. This way, they could squeeze three monsters into the game without using three times the sprites. It's a little-known fact that Mr. Colin based the portrait of George on himself, Lizzie on his wife, and Ralph on programmer and designer Jeff Nauman. Mr. Colin did not just do the art and animation for the game, but also designed the gorgeous cabinet graphics as well. When it comes to the actual gameplay, there is no right or wrong way to play. You can choose to either play competitively or cooperatively, which was a devious play mechanic that helped with the sales. When playing in a multiplayer game, you have the freedom to either attack the other players or destroy the buildings and eat the military as quickly as possible. Rampage was released by Bally Midway in the arcades in 1986. The team suggested a press release, but the idea was lost on the marketing VP. Mr. Collin took it upon himself to write, print, and mail hundreds of press releases to the major newspapers of all the U.S. cities destroyed in the game, resulting in hundreds of articles worth of free press. As far as the game goes, you take control of a trio of humans who have been transformed into gigantic monsters due to various experiment-related accidents. George is transformed into a Kong-like creature by experimental vitamins, Lizzie is transformed into a giant reptile by a radioactive lake, and Ralph, who is apparently the Sausage King, was transformed into a giant wolf by way of a strange food additive. No idea if Clark Griswold was behind this, but he also lives in Chicago, so who knows. This is a three-player simultaneous giant monster fest which you have to destroy all the buildings and eat as many people as possible, all the while avoiding the military and trying to stay alive. The game is set across 128 days in cities all across North America. The game starts in Peoria, Illinois, because as the old adage goes, if it will play in Peoria, it will play anywhere. The controls are fairly simple with you maneuvering your character with an 8-way joystick and utilizing a punch button and a jump button. You will travel from city to city, laying the smack down all along the way. These are different cities, mostly in name only, as the graphics don't really change. The building placement will change and you will have different obstacles such as bridges and trains. According to the game's flyer, there are 768 scenes that take place across 85 cities. After day 128, you end up in Plano, Illinois, in which you are given a mega vitamin bonus which heals all the monsters and provides a large point bonus. The mega vitamin bonus occurs six times throughout the entire game, which is every 128 days. After this, you start back over in Peoria, but with a higher difficulty, including more police and military. This game is an excellent quarter muncher, where you have to climb each building and knock them down one punch at a time. The more you punch a building, the more it deteriorates until it finally collapses upon itself into a huge heap of rubble. You don't have to climb a building to cause damage, as you can stand directly in front of it and punch up. It's not going to be all rainbows and lollipops though as there are plenty of obstacles looking to take you down even though you are just a misunderstood monster. Immediately, you will have to contend with the police and military who are constantly throwing bombs and shooting at you. You also have to deal with helicopters that will hover about firing at you. All of these will result in damage to your character along with sticks of dynamite and even punches from other characters. Falling off buildings will also damage you as well. The helicopters can also be punched out of the sky and the military can be snacked upon. 
Another meal of choice are the lovely NPCs that are either in the buildings or running alongside. Speaking of the NPCs, each character can pick up one in particular and hold them. These are known as the designated victims. When you grab them, the National Guard will stop firing at you. The lady in red is George's victim. The NPC in a yellow shirt is Lizzie's and the guy in a suit is Ralph's. After you hold them for a random period of time, they will attempt to get away by punching you in your jaw and forcing you to drop them. However, if you are not down with that, you can always just go ahead and gobble them up. There are a number of enemies in the game that are looking to take you out, such as helicopters, paratroopers, police cars, which are quite speedy and fire fast, and heavily armed tanks which are so powerful they can knock you off a building. You also have to watch out for various things found in the buildings that can hurt you such as light bulbs which can harm you if they are lit, poison, television, dynamite, and people in bathtubs. You have to eat the people in bathtubs quickly otherwise they can squirt water which will knock you off the building. There is also a photographer who is trying to take your picture. If his flash goes off, so do you right off the building. The three monsters all have different attributes. George is the most rounded character who climbs and jumps better than the other two. Lizzie is the fastest and Ralph is the strongest. Something I always thought that was cool was jumping from building to building, especially when one is just getting ready to crumble to the ground. There are some good items located inside which will increase your health such as fruit, milk, turkey, hamburgers, and other things. If you are looking just for points, there are bags of loot, flower pots, manhole covers, and civilians. A number of vehicles can also be destroyed such as taxis and trains. The cool thing about the trains is in two player mode you can play a game of ping pong smashing the train back and forth. When your character is about to meet his maker and your energy bar is almost depleted, his facial expression will change looking as if he is about to keel over. When your energy is depleted, your character transforms back into his human counterpart naked and afraid. At the time, Mr. Colin had a young daughter and didn't want to have the player characters die on screen. Now we won't be seeing any pixelated boobage in this game, that would come at a later game but more on that in a few minutes. According to Mr. Colin, these few small pixels of nudity got us in more trouble than eating policemen, eating the National Guard, stopping civilians and destroying cities. He also felt that this sight gag actually played into the competitive co-op gameplay. Typically when playing, if another character reverts back to his human form, it was a scramble for them to put a quarter in and regenerate their monster before their friends could eat them. The arcade game was a, no pun intended, monster success and ended up being Midway's most successful game for a long period of time. One test location reported that 20,000 quarters were deposited into the game within five days. The arcade operator, despite the added revenue, asked that the game be removed because of the constant crowds. Apparently the title appealed to both girls and adults and not just 14 year old boys. It was also released for just about every home console and computer under the sun, but more on those later. Almost 10 years after the release of Rampage, Brian Collin and Jeff Nauman were developing a multi-character fighting game for Midway when it was decided they should do a sequel to Rampage. Rampage World Tour was released in the arcades in 1997. The game started out life not only as a three-player monster mash, but actually it was going to support four players at the same time. However, 
This was dropped a few months into development. The team wanted to make sure that the sense of humor from the first game was preserved for a world tour, which resulted in the cartoonish characters that had a claymation type appearance. In the 10 years since the original game was conceived and developed, technology had advanced at a rapid rate. The game shows off its technological power with its fantastic visuals. This time around, the monsters are not relegated to destroying only the major cities of North America, but they take their destructive antics worldwide. To aid you in your worldwide destruction, not only do you have a punch and a jump button, but you've also been given the ability to kick, meaning you can literally kick the crap out of all those big, nasty buildings. It's possible to unleash your burly leg strength and take out whole floors at once. One new addition to the gameplay is Vern, which is short for Violently Enraged Radioactive Nemesis. Vern is actually a flying, highly powerful secondary mutation of any of the three main characters. On certain half of the wrecked buildings, you can also bounce on the girders causing a bit more destruction. The buildings are larger and more detailed in this game, allowing for the screen to scroll in various directions. There is a bit of a story this time around in which busty Dr. Betty Veronica unleashes George, Lizzie and Ralph due to an explosion at Scum Labs facility. The game takes place across a number of days throughout various cities all across the world. Similar to the first outing, the game starts off in Peoria, Illinois. Once again, you have to destroy all the buildings while avoiding or destroying the military who are trying to take you down. They have their trusty, but perhaps rusty, jets, bombs, and tanks. There are also trampolines scattered throughout the city that will allow you to jump just a little bit higher. Something else to keep your eye on is when your character will have his energy depleted and transformed back to their human forms. In a blink and you'll miss it, little bit of naughtiness, you'll see some uncensored pixelated body parts which definitely warped me as a child. The ending of the game was also a bit controversial, as Dr. Betty Veronica, who is the sole survivor of Scum Labs, decides to wipe out the remaining traces of her employer's corrupt legacy and shrinks the monsters down to size. Lizzie decides to use Betty's ample assets as a trampoline and stays right in between for the remainder of her life, and I for one can't say that I blame her. World Tour was another wildly successful arcade release in 1997, but the booby trampoline ending was censored for the various home conversions. Game Refuge, which was Mr. Collins' development team who created World Tour, wanted to do a 3D rampage for the next game, but Midway felt it was too ambitious of a project. Game Refuge ended up leaving Midway, so Avalanche Software was in charge of creating the follow-up to World Tour, which resulted in Rampage 2 Universal Tour. This time around, the game skipped arcades completely and was released for the PlayStation, Nintendo 64, and Game Boy Color in 1999. The PlayStation version featured different music, but it also included full motion video cutscenes which the Nintendo 64 version lacked. This time, the original trio have been captured and confined for the entire world to witness. George is held captive in New York City. Lizzie is held in Tokyo, and Ralph is held in London. All three of these cities are possible references to King Kong, Godzilla, and an American werewolf in London. Scum Labs, who had just recently rebuilt their facilities, has another accident that results in three new monsters, Boris, a rhinoceros, Curtis, a giant mouse, and Ruby, a giant lobster monster. 
the player has the option of choosing which of the original three monsters to rescue. The gameplay is pretty much the same in which you have to destroy buildings, cars, the military, and also eat lots and lots of people. When you free one of the original three monsters, they become playable characters. This game is a lot of fun to play and the new monsters definitely bring something to the table. If you've never checked it out and are a fan of Rampage, you definitely should. The following year saw the release of Rampage Through Time, released exclusively for the PlayStation. Scum Labs have once again rebuilt themselves, but this time they created a time machine and sent employees back to deal with the destruction. Unbeknownst to them, the monsters from the previous games have somehow returned to Earth, this time joined by Harley the Warthog. There are a few different modes of play, including the campaign mode, with each time zone consisting of four stages. This is a single player affair, but the CPU will randomly select two other monsters to knock the stuffing out of you while you're trying to play. After each city though, you are rated on how much damage you did to the property and people. There is a multiplayer minigame that's also selectable. These are typically riffs on classic arcade titles such as Asteroids, Breakout, and Shootout. The game was not favorably received back in the day, but I always thought it was fun, especially for playing as the new monster. Two thousand one brought us Rampage Puzzle Attack for the Game Boy Advance, which honestly I have only played a few times and I thought was merely average. The gameplay is similar to Super Puzzle Fighter 2 Turbo and it does offer a two player mode. <laughs> Rampage Total Destruction was released in 2006 for the GameCube, PlayStation 2, and Nintendo Wii. Those dirty little devils from Scum Labs have brought themselves back and this time created Scum Soda. A man by the name of George is taste testing the product causing George to mutate. This ends up with a number of other mutations. The gameplay is very similar to the original Rampage, although this time around you have the ability to climb up the front of a building to destroy it. Hidden inside each city are special tokens that when eaten will unlock brand new characters and special abilities. The more destruction you cause, the faster your special meter will fill, which utilizes special abilities for each monster. One cool thing is that the original arcade versions of Rampage and Rampage World Tour are both included on the disc. The Nintendo Wii version also features some new upgrades including 10 more monsters and a new city. It plays a decent game of Rampage but something feels just a bit off. In 2018, the game was made into a big blockbuster summer action flick entitled simply Rampage and it starred Dwayne The Rock Johnson. The 2018 arcade game, which can still be played at places such as Dave & Buster's, is an updated version of the original title with some insanely detailed visuals. The game has three monsters similar to the first game, including George, Lizzie, and Ralph, 
with the monsters having their designs changed to match their movie counterparts. You need to destroy all the buildings as you advance through the levels, eating as many people as you can, destroying helicopters, tanks, and police cars all along the way. The gameplay is a lot faster than previous games, meaning buildings can be destroyed much quicker. You can collect power-ups which will see your on-screen character grow in size. It's a pretty fun little title and I was amazed at how detailed the graphics were. While the game still retains this three-player simultaneous style of gameplay, everything has been simplified. In this game, you have a joystick but only one action button instead of two. Speaking of the movie really quick, I enjoyed it for what it was, which was a simple popcorn flick. Mr. Collin informed me that he didn't receive any royalties from the movie, although the company did reach out to him. The game itself has been merchandised over the years with everything from t-shirts, stretchable figures, Funko Pops, figures from the movie, the obligatory Tiger LCD handheld game, and even a tabletop version of the game which unfortunately plays the NES version and not the arcade. However, whereas the original NES title omitted Ralph, this version puts him right back where he belongs. More on the NES version in just a moment. The fantastic people at Arcade 1UP even released an actual Rampage arcade cabinet which turned out really, really cool. The arcade game has a cameo in the 2018 Dwayne Johnson film. There's also an extremely quick blink and you'll definitely miss it arcade cabinet in Terminator 2 Judgment Day. Thanks to Retro Gamer Magazine, we have a list of all the monsters that have appeared in all of the games. In 2002, Midway licensed Rampage along with a number of other Williams Electronic Games for Shockwave, which would allow you to play these classic games in your browser. It has also been included on a number of compilations over the years, including the Arcade Party Pack for the PlayStation, Midway Arcade Treasures for Xbox, PlayStation 2, and GameCube, and also Midway Arcade Treasures Extended Play for the PSP. It was also a big part of Midway Arcade Origins. Midway's arcade app also received a version for the iOS. In 2015, the original arcade game was an unlockable as part of LEGO Dimensions. After these messages, we'll be right back. Yeah. Now an important announcement from Rampage. Uh, you heard it. Rampage World Tour from Midway is now available for Nintendo 64. Now one to three players can destroy the world while eating anything they can find. <laughs> now let's talk about the various home conversions. As with any other conversions at the time, some of these turned out really good and others have quite a bit of stank on them. Okay everybody, I don't mean to start this look at the various conversions on such a sour note, but the first one we are taking a look at is the Atari 2600 version. The little wood grained machine will always have a special place in my heart, but some conversions just shouldn't be attempted. Take a look at Double Dragon for the 2600 and you'll see what I mean. This game tries its mightiest and I have to give it props for at least looking a little like the original arcade game. While the buildings are strictly rectangles with very little animation, a lot of the arcade's content has been brought over including a very nice title screen and in between cutscenes. We get plenty of buildings to demolish with helicopters cop cars and the military shooting at you. You still have to climb the building and punch them to destroy it, but it's all done with only one fire button. As far as the monsters go, they look like something that crawled right out of my toilet, but overall, the game could have been a whole lot worse.
Have you ever wondered why the Atari Lynx version looks so different? That's because it started out life as a totally different game. It was originally a clone of Rampage called Monster Demolition, which saw your monsters, including both Godzilla and King Kong, create all sorts of destruction. After the license for Rampage was acquired, it became the game we all know and love today. The Atari Lynx version uses large sprites in order for everything to be seen on the tiny screen. With these large sprites means that the levels now have to scroll, which is not that big of a deal. This allows for the Lynx to flex its 16-bit muscles and show off its color palette and detailed characters. This game even introduced a new monster in the form of a giant mouse. While the music is a bit basic, the sound effects are really nice and are very reminiscent of the original arcade game. The controls are pretty good and it's a lot of fun to play. The game was also released for the TRS-80 Coco and it turned out pretty good. The graphics are large and colorful and while the sound effects could have been better, they're not too bad. All three monsters are here and the gameplay is very speedy. If you can get past the googly eye inducing color clash, the Zenic Spectrum turned out rather good. The monsters, the vehicles, and the trains are all monochrome, but everything else has a nice color to it, although that does include some purple and yellow buildings. However, the gameplay is fast and it controls well. The sound effects are pure 100% queefalicious with little bitty blasts right in your face. The Amiga version turned out really good, starting with the excellent title screen and arcade presentation. The actual gameplay is fast and furious, although the monsters look slightly different. The sound effects are absolutely fantastic with some slick stereo sound. It plays really well, despite only having one fire button. Typically, the Amiga and Atari ST versions are very similar, although this time the Atari ST version was done by a different developer and it definitely shows. The graphics on this version look like they were done using a koala pad on the Commodore 64. Everything just looks off, especially when compared to the Amiga version. The buildings are a bit on the wide side and the animation is a bit ropey. The music is not bad and there are sound effects while you play, but they aren't that great. The gameplay is very fast though and it controls fairly well. The Atari 7800 version is not bad, although the graphics are a bit on the goofy side. The monsters look like bobbleheads with cranium so large it's amazing they're able to stay upright. The game plays pretty well with plenty of action on the screen and no slowdown. The sound effects and music are not good, but they do get the job done.
Surprisingly, the Amstrad CPC version is not just a run-of-the-mill Spectrum port. This is fantastic with large, colorful sprites and fast gameplay even with three monsters on the screen. There are plenty of objects that give you grief such as the helicopters and police cars, but don't worry, there's still plenty of people to eat as well. This is fantastic and even features music and sound effects. Good old Commodore 64 version received not one, but two different ports. The first version was released in the UK and it's not very good. The colors are a bit on the drab side and there are quite a few bugs in the actual gameplay. The screen also shakes violently when a building collapses which can make the uninitiated feel a bit nauseous. The controls are also a bit finicky with your monster sometimes getting stuck on the side of a building. A couple of years later, a brand new version was released for the USA market and it is much better. The buildings are much more arcade accurate and the bugs that plague the European version are nowhere to be found. The gameplay is fast and furious with all the usual obstacles you would expect such as helicopters and police cars. It also controls really well and has some pretty good sound effects and music. Sticking with the 8-bit computer market, the Apple II version is up next and I really wish it wasn't. Great big colorful globs make up the monsters and they are not animated very well. The gameplay starts out slow and as soon as a few helicopters decide to join the fray, it almost comes to a complete halt. I do believe my grandma's bowel movements are quicker than the animation in this game. The animation is so slow that it really hinders the gameplay. However, just getting something that even remotely resembles Rampage up and running on the Apple II is quite the achievement. The Atari 8-bit computer line is rather fugly. The monsters, while large, are only single color sprites and there is a lot of color clash going on. With that being said, despite the wide load buildings, the gameplay is fast, almost a bit too fast, but it does offer some decent music while you play. The controls are sticky though, making buildings extremely hard to climb unless you're in the exact position. The NES version is up next and as I mentioned, Ralph is completely missing which leaves only two selectable monsters, George and Lizzie. The graphics have been sanitized a bit and the colors are not that attractive. The gameplay is fairly smooth thanks to some pretty good animation on everything from the buildings to the actual characters themselves. Unfortunately, 
You can't jump between buildings, which was always fun to do in the original arcade game. The sound effects are decent, and we even get pretty good music while we play. Sega Master System is absolutely fantastic. While it's not as close to the arcade game as we would like, the gameplay is nice and tight. The sprites are large and colorful and the buildings are animated fairly well. It's amazing how much better this version turned out over the NES. The sound effects and music are fine and it controls fairly well, although again, you have to be lined up with the building just right in order to climb it. Overall though, it's an excellent version of the arcade game. The game was even ported for the MS-DOS platform, which came in two flavors, CGA and EGA. These look similar to the TRS Coco versions, but not quite as good. The animation is a bit choppy choppy, and it's not very fast. This all results in a game that's a bit of a chore to play. Rampage is a bona fide classic. There is something about controlling those mutated monsters and causing all sorts of destruction that is oh so much fun. Throw in the ability to eat people and give your friend a good smack in the face for no reason and you've got a game that's a lot of fun to play. If you've never had the chance to visit downtown Peoria all the while climbing buildings, and punching military helicopters out of the sky, be sure and give this game a shot. You'll be glad you did. Just wanted to say thanks to Rampage creator Brian Collin for answering my questions. If you like this video, be sure to like, comment, share, and subscribe. Also, if you would like to support me on Patreon, please click the link below. If you would like to contribute but not sign up for my Patreon, you can always click the donate button up above. Thanks everyone for watching.